welcome everyone to the Southern Plains Climate Science Webinar Series. The South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, also known as the South Central CASC, uses this platform to highlight projects that have been funded through the center. Today, I am excited to highlight the South Central CASC funded project, a roadmap to the developing resilient coastal shellfish populations using sorry, using spatial and process-based modeling for restoration under current and predicted future water quality conditions. To share about this project, we are pleased to have Dr. Romain Lavad. Welcome, Dr. Lavad. Thank you very much, Kari. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining this presentation. Um, I'm really happy to talk about this project that uh, concluded um, uh, this fall. And um, if you're not familiar with oysters, um, two things to know for um, this species is that it's really important for the northern Gulf of Mexico, and especially Louisiana, uh, because it's a, it's a very important eco economic species. Louisiana landings represent 44% of uh, the nation's landing. Uh, in terms of in terms of weight, and it's also a very important species ecologically because it provides a lot of services um, to protect trawlines, to um, dampen the effect of sea level rise and storm surge, and also to provide refuge to a variety of uh, uh, critters that inhabit these uh, estuaries where oyster reefs grow. Uh, there are about twenty estuaries along the northern Gulf. Uh, of Mexico coast uh, that have very contrasted uh, hydroclimatology, um, uh, which support these oyster reefs. And uh, more and more, we see that uh, these reefs are an imperiled resource due to uh, various factors. Uh, if you look at the map on the bottom right here, you see the, the color code that's <clears throat> already pretty uh, 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 orangey, uh, tending uh, to the, the worst uh, condition. And uh, globally, we uh, estimate that about 80% uh, of uh, oyster reefs worldwide have been uh, have been lost. So among these challenges, uh, I mentioned climate change, it's a, it's a very important one. We see a, a rise in the temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, which affect uh, these species, particularly because it's already at the, the southern limits of its uh, distribution range. Uh, there are also some uh, challenges uh, arising from the the management of uh, of the the, the rivers, uh, particularly the Mississippi River. That's the the big one in the region. Um, different projects uh, aimed at protecting the coast and rebuilding the coast imply the the creation of uh, diversions uh, along the course of the river, which mean uh, an input of fresh water. Uh, to very to different bays where uh, oyster um, are present, and oysters are uh, marine organism, estuarine organism, and uh, they are impacted by these uh, by these changes in salinity. And we'll go we'll come back to this uh, a bit later. Uh, fishery management is also uh, has also impact. Um, the, the closure or opening of uh, uh, grounds where fishermen can get uh, their oysters is, is has a big uh, a big impact uh, on the, the the populations uh, along these uh, along the coast and uh, not really a challenge but a restoration effort are also an important uh, aspect of the how these oyster reefs uh, develop and 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 can be maintained uh, also uh, and there are a lot of effort put uh, all throughout the northern gulf of mexico millions and millions of dollars actually uh, put towards the, the restoration of natural reef which uh, are also important for uh, aquaculture production because a lot of um, a lot of estuaries where oyster men um, fish rely on these natural reef to um, produce young oysters that they can then harvest. So through this project, uh, <clears throat> we set to identify suitable locations for ensuring resilient and sustainable wild populations of oysters, which would also support future production and aquaculture success. Um, this project um, 
was from the to the cask and um this is uh, the, the approach that we dis we propose to uh, to take uh, to answer this question to identifying these these more suitable zones uh it's a a, a three part approach the first part is the core of uh, of our study which is uh, the use of a mechanistic bioenergetic model uh which uh, tells us how the oysters um, collect and, and, and use the energy that is available to them and how they are impacted by environmental conditions. And as any bioenergetic model, you can get different outputs that uh, I'll go through uh, briefly uh, afterwards. <clears throat> but this model is, is uh, forced by environmental conditions. And uh, we first uh, wanted to see what are the current uh, conditions to establish a good um, understanding of what is the variability in, in current conditions using field and remote sense data. And in a second time, uh, look into what future conditions could be uh, for the region. And uh, using these uh, building scenarios, modeling scenarios to try to predict um, the production outcomes uh, and dif in different sites in order to inform fisheries and restoration um, projects. So the, the end goal is really to provide uh, valuable and usable information for managers, whether they are interested in restoration or uh, more a fishery. And um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you at the end uh, how, we, uh, how we shared this information with them. So going back to the core uh, of uh, this study <clears throat> is the bioenergetic model for the oysters. It's based on a, on a theory called the dynamic energy budget theory, DEB for short. And DEB models uh, are becoming uh, more and more popular uh, because one of the, the main reasons is that they are applicable to uh, any, any living organism. It's based on... Uh, simple principle of biology uh, you need food to uh, to grow and reproduce and you see here a schematic of um, of the fluxes of energy between the environment and the organism and within the organism so these schematics describe the, the acquisition and allocation of mass and energy through uh, food and another important uh, aspect of, uh, of this theory is that it covers the entire life cycle. Uh, you can start from an embryo and, uh, up and until the death of, of the organism. It is process-based uh, as opposed to uh, relying on statistical uh, relationships. Um, for example, uh, we use uh, experimental um, data and, and field data to uh, calibrate and validate this model using experiments on what's the effect for example of temperature on the different processes on the different allocation of energy fluxes and from from that uh, general uh, simplistic view let's say of of the uh, the bioenergetics of uh, of the organism we can get a variety of outputs ranging from age mass uh, size at different uh, life stages growth rate, respiration rates, feeding rates, et cetera, et cetera. You have a, a non-exhaustive list here. But it's a, <clears throat> so it, it, it's a, a model that is based on processes. And because of that, we can use this, um, this model to look into uh, what future condition or any type of, of condition, environmental condition could have uh, on the organism. Uh, and this this is particularly important when we uh, aim to um, study the effect of future condition, which uh, can be different, uh, and we'll see about that uh, compared to current conditions. So this particular DEB model for oysters has been, uh, we, we worked uh, in the years past to calibrate it and validate it throughout the coast. Uh, it's been applied in, in many of these uh, different locations. Um, and I'm going to focus now on, on what we did, particularly in, in this study and where we applied this uh, this uh, dev model. 
we had two aspects, uh, as I described uh, in the general uh, uh, schematic of the of the project. Uh, one that was focused on current conditions, and these are uh, here represented by the colored uh, areas. So we selected six different uh, study areas <clears throat> throughout Texas and Louisiana, uh, in which uh, we uh, put a model every 200 meters in this space. Uh, so each point, uh, which uh, is very, uh, very small, each point is very small there, they're just colored area, represent the location where we, we run our, our model. Uh, so we have yeah three bays in uh, in Texas um, or uh, a set of of uh, bays. Sometimes uh, you see here in West Texas, Southwest Texas, uh, the CAS um, uh, system represent three estuaries, um, and then three other uh, systems in uh, in Louisiana. And for future conditions, uh, we uh, extended a little bit. Uh, the uh, the domain uh, in which we uh, model the um, uh, the production of oysters and this is just based on on data availability it's uh, for these uh, these future condition we relied on uh, climate protection models which generally cover the entire ocean and so we can we could even go further but it's not very relevant for uh, for these species even um, like I think we went uh, to, 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 um, 75 kilometers offshore so that's debatable but we we wanted to see what the what the predictions could be for um uh, for the oysters and the resolution is a lot coarser for um, much coarser for future projection again because of data availability these these uh, big models on don't have a, a resolution as good as what we can have for uh, for current conditions um, <clears throat> and so to run the model, we need um, basically two um, forcing uh, variables, temperature and salinity. Um, we also use in these models uh, generally uh, food availability. However, um, for oysters, it's usually we usually um, count for that through uh, chlorophyll A, uh, a proxy for, for their food supply. The data uh, available for uh, for this uh, for this variable are not necessarily available in in all the the systems we were uh, studying. So we made assumptions about about this uh, environmental forcing. But for temperature and salinity, um, we collected data from a various of uh, a variety of um, uh, data source ranging from monitoring station, so uh, actual observed and, and recorded data, to uh, remotely sensed data uh, through these different agencies. And so we collected data for uh, two periods, uh, a current period from 2014 to 2020, and a future period from 2041 to 2050. Now, this future period is um, based on, a, a again, on a climate projection model. Uh, for ocean conditions and um, for the current period we could also analyze year by year what these uh, what these conditions were um, and so after collecting all this data uh, we could uh, have we could build these um, averages so for each day of a year for every January 1st, every January 2nd, we can say these are the average condition for current uh, conditions and the same uh, for uh, future conditions. And so this is how we uh, set out to compare current conditions to, to future conditions. And again, we explore the, uh, what uh, single year conditions were for current, current condition in each single year, 2014, 2015, and 2020. Uh, how we run the model, we started it with um, a six millimeter oyster, we, which corresponds to uh, the size of oysters that uh, fishermen uh, used in aquaculture. That's usually the size that they get uh, from uh, hatcheries. And uh, we started the simulations on, on May 15th, which is again the time of the year that usually they uh, start to seed uh, their, uh, uh, their lease or their, uh, their farms. 
and we ran it for one year um, and got a different uh, set of outputs, uh, including shell height, shell growth, tissue mass, the number of eggs that was spawn, uh, the time it took to reach market size, which is 75 millimeters, and uh, the mortality. Um, <clears throat> so all these metrics were collected after one year of simulation, and they were standardized between zero and one, zero being uh, bad and one being good. And uh, from these metrics, we calculated uh, indices, uh, one for aquaculture and one for restoration. The suitability index for aquaculture included shell height and time to market size. And the suitability index uh, uh, included tissue weight and the accumulated egg spawned. Now, these are uh, simplified uh, suitability in the indices. If you know a little bit of the literature, you know that um, there are many other factors that, that can be included. Here, we uh, try to focus on, on, on the energy size of things. Uh, and um, these suitability indices could be complemented with other metrics. But uh, the, the choice we made, the choices we made were to uh, reflect really what, what a fisherman uh, what is important for fishermen, for example, so growth in height, which is usually what um, what is important so that they can reach market size. And for restoration, uh, focus more on the reproductive side of things because um, these are, are, are the important metrics for uh, the uh, dynamics of oyster reefs, uh, uh, how, how many larvae they can produce and, and uh, to, uh, to sustain the, the populations. Um, we could only compare current and future outputs for two estuaries based on the uh, distribution of uh, the projections for future conditions. Uh, two estuaries from Louisiana. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some uh, some maps after that. And uh, we also uh, looked uh, in more details into uh, the survival of uh, oysters during the co the, the current conditions. Um, the, the, the current years, and uh, I'll show you also some some results on, on this. So let's jump into the results, and um, here you have uh, outputs for shell heights uh, and top uh, top left uh, accumulated uh, egg spawn, uh, time uh, tissue uh, wet weight, and uh, the time it took for uh, the oysters to reach uh, market size and the mortality. Um, for uh, oysters in Barataria Bay under current conditions. So these are again average, uh, the, the daily average of conditions between 2014 and 2020. And uh, these are the results of the simulation after one year of simulation. So for example, if you take the shell height, um, you see that they reach uh, between uh, 8 and 10. Uh, so these are the yellow colors, uh, centimeters uh, in most part of the bay. Uh, and at the mouth of the of the estuaries, um, these numbers are, are much lower. Um, and uh, for mortality, I see that my uh, legend is miss missing uh, something. My um, it's it says cause of mortality because we could also identify what was the cause of death for the oyster, and uh, I'll, I'll detail this a little bit uh, further uh, afterwards. But these are the generic uh, the general outputs we get, and from these. We uh, calculated our suitability indices uh, for each bay. And here on the left, you have the su uh, suitability index for agriculture and on the right for restoration. Uh, again, ranging from zero to one. And uh, what we see is that the, uh, the offshore uh, uh, part of the estuary, um, here you have, cannot really see, but the barrier island is uh, in Barataria Bay is, is located around there, which is the Grand Isle. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we, we get uh, average indices in the middle of the bay and going, going outside of the bay, we get, we get higher indices. Uh, and a similar pattern for, uh, for restoration. Uh, next, we can compare uh, the, or have a look at, at all the different systems that we uh, we run the model in. And uh, at the top, you have all the Texas estuaries. Um, <clears throat> here on the on the top left, you have the uh, 
Kupano Bay, Aransas, uh, estuaries in the middle. Here you have Madagorda, estuary, Galveston on the top right. And at the bottom, you have the, the three Louisiana estuaries, the Calcasieu and, and uh, the Chenier Basin, Barataria Bay, and then on the bottom right, uh, Breton Sound. And so you can see from uh, this uh, suitability index uh, for aquaculture that Louisiana sites are um, expected to be more productive, which is uh, typically the case. One main reason for that is that oysters grow a lot faster and they reach market size uh, a lot faster. Um, for example, in Galveston, again, top right, and, and Matagorda Bay uh, in the center top, um, oysters are not expected to reach market size within one year of simulations. Uh, and this is this uh, fits what uh, we observe uh, in in, uh, in the field. Uh, and this is why the uh, the color is generally uh, more uh, in in the uh, mid range of, of the scale here for this suitability index. Uh, for the uh, restoration index, uh, the picture is a little different um, because uh, oysters can start spawning very young and uh, the number of eggs uh, spawn is part of the uh, output that we use to calculate this restoration index. And so here the, the Texas estuaries um, perform uh, a lot better. Another uh, pattern, interesting pattern that we already observed for the uh, aquaculture index is that in the Louisiana side, the uh, the unsuitable, let's say, zone for so the the red color in, in these estuaries is a lot uh, a lot wider, extends a lot more in in uh, in the estuary than in the Texas website, which uh, for which these uh, unsuitable areas are really confined to uh, uh, to the top of the uh, of the estuaries. Uh, the main reason for that is, is likely due to uh, the salinity regimes in, in these estuaries. Um, Louisiana uh, estuaries are a lot fresher and uh, they, uh, they experience a lot of uh, a lot more uh, fresh water input, uh, which is can be detrimental uh, for uh, uh, the oyster um, in, in some situations. All right, I won't I won't spend too much time on this. This is just a summary of all of some statistics between uh, the different uh, study areas. Uh, we uh, basically classified um, these uh, suitability indices between um, high range, medium range, and a low range. And uh, you can see, for example, that uh, the Texas estuaries uh, for aquaculture mostly um, fit into the, the medium range while the Louisiana estuaries fit more in the uh, the high range <clears throat> and um, for the restoration uh, indices it's a lot more uh, similar and uh, yeah this is just a, a summary and I, I've put here also the the result for the future which I'm going to jump into uh, right now um, oh, yeah um, yeah uh, so the the general pattern uh, is is that um, we tend to see a lower uh, uh, lower indices value uh, for both restoration and aquaculture um, because um, you see the the, the value of, of the proportion of uh, high in, in the high range uh, decreases but at the same time we uh, don't see any uh, low uh, indices in this future condition and um, that's something I'll uh, I'll discuss a little bit further. But one last uh, aspect for these um, uh, in, in this simulation that is uh, very important is uh, mortality, which is included in both indices. Uh, if an oyster dies uh, in particular area, it's uh, it 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 yields a value uh, of zero for the ind index because um, then it doesn't. Um, it's not available for fishermen to uh, to harvest, and it's not going to be a uh, relevant for uh, restoration either because it's not going to produce any eggs for future uh, for to sustain the population um, <clears throat> and so for example uh, here you have uh, a comparison between uh, Barataria Bay on the left and uh, the Copano uh, Corpus Christi Arensa and San Antonio Bay uh, on the right and uh, we classify the different uh, causes of mortality um, through uh, four uh, different categories, 
the first one being a, a deficit of um, um, energy to pay basic maintenance costs and the three others be, being a different uh, combination of temperature and salinity which we know from uh, experimental studies or field reports that uh, cause death in, in, in oysters. And um, so what we, um, what we can also look at is not only the general pattern um, that we can see from the average conditions, but it's also un under current conditions, um, af year after year, what, what, what is the variability uh, in different locations uh, of uh, particular estuaries. And so this is why we also computed a, a, what we call a cumulated uh, mortality or a, a cumulated survival, uh, if we're more optimistic about it. Um, so each year we uh, kept track of uh, how many oysters uh, or, or if oysters survive or died in a particular uh, location. And here you see, in, for example, in... in Paratai Bay again. In blue are the uh, locations where, in dark blue, are the locations in which uh, all oysters survive for each uh, single year, and in yellow, uh, where they died each and each single year. And this is uh, this is particularly relevant for uh, managers because they want to know what's the probability or what's the um, the chance that uh, oysters will survive if we put a if we decide to restore an oyster reef there or for a fisherman, like what are the chances that I get a bad year um, in this uh, in this particular location? And so we did that also for uh, for each um, each uh, study area. Again, this is for current conditions um, because we have a good uh, <clears throat> good amount of data to uh, to work with. Um, again, and this is a, a summary of the statistics. Um, and now just uh, to finish with uh, the result with the, the future conditions. Um, these are the uh, the results for the aquaculture and the restoration indices um, that uh, we uh, were able to uh, to compute. Now, if you remember, uh, I told you that uh, we were not able to compare site by site, or estuary by estuary, current versus future condition. And uh, the reason for that is uh, because the, the coverage of these um, ocean uh, projection or the climate projection models um, does not go uh, uh, deep enough into the estuaries. Uh, the coastal uh, environment is uh, usually very hard to, to model for these big climate and big ocean models. And uh, we're still lacking uh, good data to, uh, to be able to uh, to uh, use our model uh, for future conditions in these histories. However, we were uh, able to compare uh, these uh, these predictions for two histories, Barataria and uh, Breton Sound. And this is, again, I, I keep using the same example because uh, <clears throat> then you, you're more familiar with it, but uh, um, you can see the superposition of the, the previous plots, the, the previous map that I showed you. Uh, on top of which we added the, the these dots that are the, the predictions for a future condition. And uh, as I mentioned uh, when I showed you the, the data in the table is that we see a general uh, decrease in uh, in the suitability in the indices, both for agriculture and restoration. You can um, uh, see that the, the color of uh, a given point uh, when it, it, super, it is uh, superimposed with the the current condition is uh, uh, lighter or, or tends more to the red uh, compared to uh, to the current uh, conditions. But also, uh, if you look even outside of the uh, the region where we have uh, both data for current and future condition, and you can see more the, the future condition predictions, you can see that even uh, very close to the shore, we don't reach uh, the minimum value for the index. And uh, again, this is uh, due to the uh, the the availability of data or the lack of uh, of data of, of good data for future projections. Basically, these uh, future model uh, are still uh, still struggle to get good predictions at, at the coastal level, um, which uh, uh, 
necessitates uh, more interactions between uh, in this model between uh, what happened on the land and what happened in the ocean. And so basically we end up with uh, salinity regimes that are uh, not really representative of what an estuary is. Uh, we get more oceanic uh, salinity patterns. And so this is why the, the suitability indices, uh, the, the, the result is that they are higher uh, on the, along the, the coast compared to, uh, to what we see currently. All right, so <clears throat> in, to conclude, um, the first point, and uh, I was uh, highlighting this, is that um, we still are uh, missing, we're still limited uh, by the data availability for future conditions. Um, these models every year, they get improved and, and we get better uh, uh, data that we can use for this type of modeling. Um, and we're hopeful that, um, you know, in a few years from now, we can uh, have the more precise uh, uh, outputs, but this is still a, a very limiting uh, um, part of, uh, of of this kind of study for now. Uh, now, in under current conditions, we we have a very good, uh, very high capacity of of uh, predicting uh, what are what are the conditions. But uh, this is uh, yeah, this is something that we uh, we're looking forward to uh, improving. <clears throat> um, then uh, I, I wanted to highlight the, the fact also, and I mentioned that during uh, the description of the indices, that what we are able to do with this model is a uh, is some sort of potential, a niche. It's it's the potential production for a given uh, timeline and, and in, a, in a given area, as opposed to the realized niche. Uh, we do not uh, account for predation or harvest or... Uh, competition used competition so for example um these uh these th these indices could be um uh, improved by including um predation uh metrics and and for example also uh, uh, we know that some areas are not uh, suitable because the bottom is not um is not going to uh, be suitable for oysters to uh, to settle and 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 grow a reef or just because there is an oil rig somewhere, or um, this type of uh, this type of question. So this is a, a potential uh, niche uh, that is based on 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 the, the bioenergetics of the oysters, and and not necessarily a realized niche. Um, but uh, this type of modeling using a dynamic condition. So again, we used daily averages or or daily data. Uh, it's very important uh, for, especially for coastal area, because the conditions are are so changing, and and uh, we often see, <clears throat> you know, suitability suitability indices using uh, monthly averages or yearly averages, which uh, are, are, are um, good enough in in many applications, but in in estuaries where condition changes a lot, uh, if you have, for example. Uh, a low salinity, a very low salinity for uh, for a whole week. In, in some, in under certain conditions, it can yield to uh, to um, a lot high numbers of of mortalities. And so, using dynamic conditions is uh, uh, is very important. And and we were able to uh, to achieve that with uh, with this type of uh, bioenergetic modeling. And uh, the last point to uh, uh, take home would be that uh, the offshore locations were predict predicted to perform uh, better. Um, we need to, we want to uh, uh, look more into this because, uh, for first, this is an interesting pattern. This has been a, a question that uh, managers have had for a, a long time now, and uh, there's been some reports uh, also. Um, recently about the, the the feasibility of offshore aquaculture and so this ties a little bit into uh, into this and uh it's uh it would be interesting uh, in my opinion to uh, to look further into uh, into this uh, this offshore uh, production um so yeah the the in conclusion the, this process based uh, modeling uh, we feel is a valuable tool for uh, for managers uh, it provides them with a, a clear um, vision of the, the potential for uh, for uh, oyster productions uh, in these different areas and um, just uh, to finish with some uh, perspectives 
and and things that I've already mentioned. But uh, we'd like to further uh, develop these uh, these indices to uh, be able to include the bottom type, the you know, usage competition of of different areas. The include also regulatory limitations not everywhere is we can set up a, an aquaculture farm for example or or uh, etc um and uh, uh, also include uh, reef connectivity i'll mention this in the in my last slide uh for future conditions as i said we we made assumptions on on the food availability <clears throat> this is something that could be uh, also further developed uh if we can uh, uh, put our hand on on uh, better data or data that become more available. Um, we also uh, hope that we'll be able to uh, to get more um, refined uh, projections for future conditions. Um, another aspect of this uh, research and and this model in particular is that it can be uh, further developed into what we call individual based modeling. Uh, right now we basically simulate a, a single oyster in a, in a given location. We are working currently on developing uh, a, a tool that would represent a whole population or a whole reef in a single area where you could have different generations of, of oysters uh, at the same time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the last, the last point is that, um, this uh, this type of modeling, because it relies on processes that are common to uh, a different organism, can be applied to a variety of species. Um, we, uh, we we can probably uh, apply this uh, this exact same same type of research pending a modification of the parameters because the bi biological capacity are is different for for the different species. But for blue crabs, round or pink shrimp, that are also valuable. Uh, species in this uh, in this area um yeah i was going to mention briefly uh that the uh, the connectivity between oyster reef is also something important and this is why we're trying to lean into the the individual base modeling approach um because oysters um, are present you know it's not uh, a reef doesn't cover an entire area it's it's patchy it's it's what we call a meta population and so to be able to really understand the dynamics of of uh, these oyster reefs um we need to uh, to look more into this uh, this type of um, of uh, research and i'll end here um as i'm running out of time um just a further reading this uh, this uh, research uh, is uh, currently under revision for publication in uh, ecological modeling uh, all the results that I presented, the maps, the data, the the outputs are available in a, a USGS technical report. Uh, I put the link here. And uh, if you want examples or so, because I said, I mentioned that this uh, type of modeling is applicable to any species, uh, you can have some uh, terrestrial examples too. Uh, these type of models are applied to any kind of organism, even plants and, and algae. And uh, this is just... Uh, research from a colleague uh, that uh, worked on visit and completely different but if you are interested in uh thank you for your attention and uh